Trout. Um, I'm the professor teaching the course that uh, normally meets at this time, IST 235, Gender in the Information Technology Sector. So the timing of this course is perfect with a, a startup week. So I want to welcome our students who are watching this class live around the other campuses and also the students who are uh, watching this uh, lecture as part of the online section of this course. And now I'm done speaking for the day, so um, I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to the uh, startup committee. Hi, my name is Liz Lern, and today I have the pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Jamie Goldberg and Holden Como. Um, but before that, uh, just a few general announcements. If you guys have cell phones, we don't encourage you to turn them off, but keep them on silent and live tweet during the presentation, live tweet any pictures, anything you guys find particularly interesting. Um, just remember to hashtag ISC Startup. Um, and then we're also going to be taking questions through Poll Everywhere on the number that you can see over there, um, as well as questions through the Twitter, because I'll be monitoring that, and so then we can ask our speakers at the end. Um, and so then, if you guys are not familiar, we also have a passport um, initiative going on this year, and I'll explain that more at the end. Um, but if you, don't, if you know what that is, we'll be handing out speakers at the very end of the session. Um, and then if anybody is not interested in being, um, being photographed, please move to the back of the room. Okay, so now to introduce our speakers. Um, Jamie Ann Goldberg leads strategic planning and business development initiatives at Silverline Athletics. Jamie is an expert at finding opportunities within fragmented in industries and has 20 years of experience in the institutional investment management industry. Prior to co-founding Silverline, Jamie was a chief strategy officer at BNY Mellon in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, where she was responsible for the planning and execution of strategic global expansion initiatives and organizational design, and for the development and implementation of operational processes and procedures. She also serves on the ex external advisory board of Penn State's Schreier Honors College and is a former vice chairper chairperson for the Cadence Cycling Foundation. She holds a BA in real estate and finance from Penn State's Schreier Honors College and an MBA from Columbia Business School. Holden leads technology development and implementation at Silverline. Holden is a former professional triathlete with deep endurance sports industry ex expertise. Prior to co-founding Silverline, Holden was a nationally recognized triathlon coach for the Cadence Cycling Foundation and Multisport in Philadelphia, PA. So now, without further ado, our speaker. Thank you for having us. Holden and I both graduated from Penn State and we're really proud of our school. Um, and we're, we were so proud to see the whole itinerary that we got in the mail, uh, by email, that all the speakers coming back and that you guys are on the cutting edge of learning and we're really proud to hear from all industries as reported in the Wall Street Journal that Penn State has like the most employable students and um, it means a lot to us to be here and our goal of today is, is very sincerely to help you think about what disruption means because that's what we're doing and not just disrupting something small disrupting an industry not just a company and we want to bring that back to you and to you personally and to help you think about it regardless of whether you're starting a company, whether you're in, um, whether you're in a completely different industry than, than IT, but, but very much technology is the source of disrup disruption in many industries. So we wanted to use Silverline as a case study and so just telling you Silverline, very simply, video playback technology in endurance sports. So what's video playback technology? What's endurance sports? This is endurance sports. Running, does anyone run marathons or, or uh, half marathons, 10Ks, bicycle rides? Yes, okay. Triathlons, small but very intense market. This is the largest growing market, the, the, the mud runs, the mud and blood with barbed wire, fire, tattoos at the end. You can get your tattoo and visit your paramedic and get stitched up from the barbed wire. All of this, we have a statistic of three million. Um, this is not three million. The statistics can't keep up with, with the obstacle course events. The, the one of our potential clients is three million in and of themselves and there's dozens out there. So all of these endurance events don't have access to the kind of technology that everyone else in the world does. And the reason for that is that they don't have the expertise or the experience knowing how to apply it. 
um, because most of the people in that industry are athletes themselves. We thought a short video about Silverline would be helpful to show what we are, to tell you about us. This is intended for event managers who are our clients. In the world of endurance sports, sponsorship has evolved. It's not just banners, bags, and chalk on the road anymore. Sponsorship is now digital. 88% of all sponsors are demanding digital activation. And the fastest growing digital product is also the one that delivers both the most powerful message and receives the strongest response. It's video. In May of 2012, the world watched 40 billion digital videos in one month, smashing the previous record of 9 billion. New technologies are feeding an insatiable public appetite and making it easier and more enjoyable than ever to stream and watch video. Two-thirds of all the data traffic on the internet every day is video. The world is watching. What are you going to show them? Silverline is, simply, video technology. Silverline is used by event managers and business leaders in the endurance sports industry. It's simple. All the videos that matter to you, however you make them, with your phone, with your sponsors, with the film crew, Silverline provides video management tools and puts custom and secure video playback technology right on your website. In just two easy steps, Silverline works with your team to design a custom player and solutions to organize and distribute your content in any way you'd like. Silverline gives you the power to control, publish, and monetize your content the way you want to and without compromises or embarrassing distractions. So you can make money, strengthen your brand, and build your community on your terms. In the endurance sports industry, right now there is a billion dollars in digital advertising up for grabs. Your sponsors are already making digital ad buys. Are they buying from you? Silverline provides the most valuable digital real estate in the endurance sports industry right on your website. You deserve your fair share. It's time to take it. So as it relates to Silverline, we're just video. There's YouTube, there's a million other video managers out there. And what does it mean to be disruptive? And sometimes it means inventing a whole new technology. But sometimes it means just repositioning it or making it available to people in a different way than they ever had before. And that's a really simple concept that's all we're doing to disrupt. So we're disrupting by changing the flow of dollars. We're disrupting by changing who controls video. And right now, when all video is sent to YouTube, YouTube controls it and they monetize it. Um, and you don't always benefit from it. And what event managers do, as it relates to us, is they can monetize their own video on their own websites. Event managers have a sponsor inventory. So they might have, you've seen, you go and see a finish line, there's a big sign at the finish line. Or there might be things in your goodie bag, or there might be a, a pre-race training seminar that are all sponsored. What's happening with global brands is that they're shifting and they want a digital dimension to sponsorship and event managers cannot provide it. So we simply took what was already there, we adapted the technology and we made it digestible and usable by event managers. And, th and the question is, so why is disruption important? And I mean, Hold Holden and I talk about it all the time. Holden's career is being a professional triathlete was always talking about evolution and continuously improving and it really translates well to here with disruption. So Holden, why do these companies or any companies need to disrupt? I think that uh, we certainly noticed in the endurance sports industry and I think it's true for really any company or any industry that change and adaptation to kind of the status quo, the way organizations are used to going about work is very challenging. For some larger organizations, Google for example, they're big enough and they're innovative enough that they can set up a structure within their own organizations to adapt, to try new things, to come up with new innovations. But when you look at an entire industry, sometimes it's really difficult 
for an industry who is used to working in a certain, a certain manner, manner to come up with new and innovative approaches. We saw this happening in the endurance sports industry as a whole, um, and that's where we positioned our industry or, or our business to come in and affect change on a, on a global scale. What we're really changing here is how the sponsorship equation all is managed in the endurance sports industry. And I think that is an applicable lesson that can be applied to many different industries. That as an organization, if your goal is to come in and change the way business is done in a traditional sense, there's opportunity there. Advice that we were given as we were starting is follow the flow of money. How does the money flow? And that will tell you how to map out disruption because you want to put yourself, if you're changing the flow of money and you're putting yourself in the center of it. As it relates to us, we're, we're becoming the medium, the tool, to capitalize on digital sponsorship. So we put ourselves right in the middle of that equation. And to show you where we fit in, um, to give you a sense of Silverline, if this is uh, revenue potential and, and cost and difficulty to implement, there are organizations out there that GE and Miramax use that are video host providers that are the Uyalas and Bright Coves of the world. And then there are at the other end of the spectrum some that are really inexpensive that are free but that you don't have control over and you can't make money from that are the YouTubes and the Vimeos of the world. And we simply stood, we call it standing on the shoulders of giants and we worked with Bright Cove to be our back end because we knew that the special piece wasn't the video hosting. We wanted to use an organization that the New York Times already used and we weren't going to worry about it um, not working. We wanted to, to focus on what we knew how to do best which was bring this great technology to a broader audience. And I have, I have a very funny story about this. So we, got, we spent a lot of money, more money than any of our clients could do by themselves. And we built a program on top of it so that they could then access and manage their video on Brightcove. So all along, we're in our pilot year. We have very small events that we're piloting with. And then we got the Marine Corps Marathon. And the Marine Corps Marathon had a launch. They had a, they had a launch of a, a premiere of a motivational video. It was a seven minute video. And it, was, it made everyone cry who watched it. And they launched it the night before their registration of their event. And all along, we've been telling our clients, oh, no problem, same technology as the New York Times, it's not gonna crash. But still, the night before, when we launched that video, I called up our client service rep at Bright Cove, and I said, so when everyone signs on all at once, it's gonna be okay? And he said, um, Jamie, it's the same technology as the New York Times. <laughs> if they're okay, then you're gonna be fine with the launch of the Marine Corps Marathon. And we were, and there were, hundreds of thousands of people accessing the video all at once watching it went beautifully. Um, the engagement rates were ridiculous. Were they like 80% of a seven minute video, 80 to 100% of a seven minute video? Um, everyone who, who had it come up in front of them clicked play and watched it to the end. And uh, the next day their registration crashed. So, um, because so many people were accessing. We had nothing to do with the registration. It was a long-standing relationship. But we stood up to uh, the Marines, and we were really proud of that. Um, That's a, that a fun story. So we've been scaling ever since. And we now, have, we now have events that have approximately 13 million, either, either on our platform or under contract or very close in the pipeline, 13 million spectators or um, athletes participating who are coming on. Now that's super small in the world of the, of the web. Uh, however, if you look at endurance sports, and if you look at any other industry that's a niche industry, and is fragmented and non-tech, a number like that is huge. And you look at, have anyone heard of Runner's World magazine? Okay, we're talking like 600,000 in, in circulation. Um, bicycling magazine, 800,000 in circulation. Um, sports Illustrated, magazine, three million, and, and we're talking about numbers that, yeah, yes, they're very small, we know that, but um, that's fine with us. If we get a dominant, you know, Google-like market share of the endurance sports industry, that's fine with us. This gives you a sense where we're positioned and in, in how, we've, uh, how we've well we've been received in the market. We wanted to give you a road map, and I think that if we're going to give you something to take away, it's the how because ideas are really easy and it's the execution of them that is the really challenging thing. I've, I've debated 
with, with people? Is it, is it 5% idea? Is it 10% idea and 90% execution? So um, it, it's something like that, like the best idea in the world, um, if not executed properly, just doesn't happen. And there, there's, a, where there's a roadmap that we have that we're using that we wanted to share with you um, to take away today. And, th and the first one is to root in experience. I want to talk about what experience means because it doesn't just mean tech experience. And I I I'm going to hand this to Holden to talk about, but I just wanted to get a sense from the people in the room is it, who here is outside of this college, I, IST? Is anyone outside? Okay, so there's a fair share. And so this, this applies anywhere, um, and especially in the expertise. So I, I think a, a, a roadmap to, dis, uh, to disruption is, is this is really how we, we started our company. Um, we did not come together and, and chat one day and say, hey, let's, let's film or let's create a, a video ad network and apply it to the endurance sports industry. What we really wanted to do, the spark that kind of, that kind of was, was at behind our founding, was that we wanted to change the way things were happening in the endurance sports industry. Um, and we did that, all of that came out of our expertise. Jamie was a triathlete. I was a professional triathlete, uh, triathlete for a long time. I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, I was a swimmer here at Penn State as well in 2000, so it's always great to come back. Um, but uh, it, it, that, that's really where our company started. So it wasn't a, a specific understanding of, of, of technology. We didn't have any, any sort of, any, uh, we're, we're not technologists really. It's been a steep learning curve for us. But we were trying to change the way the endurance sports industry did business. And we knew that there was a technological application in the endurance sports industry, but it was really all stemming out of our expertise. Um, so there's a few different kind of approaches and ways to think about y y your, what, what you are an expert at. I think to, to many in this audience, there's probably a lot of people who are, who are experts in technology in some way or another. And that is an expertise that certainly you can re revolve around and kind of grow out of. And, and if you can develop some amazing IP and, and apply that in really incredible ways. But that's not the only way that you can go about kind of changing and using technology to, to create a company. Um, you can have an expertise in your specific industry, and that's where, where we kind of got our, our start as well. Um, and finally, uh, we, we, we feel as though if you have a particular expertise in the relationships you have, um, this is also something that we touch upon a bit. We didn't necessarily start out with an expertise in relationships, although coming from a professional uh, athletic background, I definitely had um, a number of relationships in the industry that were, were helpful, except those were kind of all revolving around the triathlon space, which of the endurance sports industry is kind of the smallest segment. Um, that, however, the relationships is probably the component that we have developed as, we, as we've kind of built the company through the first couple of years, um, focusing on building and becoming uh, better, more, better experts at, at how we manage our, our client relationships and all of our, rela our partner relationships is really something that we feel is uh, contributing significantly to our, to our business. Um, secondly, there's uh, point two in the roadmap. Um, we we want to look at identifying a trend. So after we came together and recognized that something needed to happen in the endurance sports industry, specifically revolving around sponsorship and advertising, um, we knew there was a technological application that, that there was some opportunity there because the endurance sports industry was completely lacking. Um, so we thought to ourselves, what could we do to address um, what in the world of technology could be applied to this industry? Um, and again, we're not technologists. So we didn't really, we're looking at it from kind of an outsider's perspective. Um, we tried to identify what a major trend was and, 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 and find a technological application that could fit really well. That was very clearly video. In the video that we played in the beginning, there was a s statistic that said that there were 48 billion video views viewed in a month in May of 2012. Much of that was because of what Google did with YouTube. They made video much more accessible. There's, uh, there, there are some other kind of trends that are and, and infrastructure changes that are, that are encouraging and promoting the consumption of video. That has to do with software and, and hardware innovation. So, it's, so everyone is, is, is connected. Um, it's much easier to view video on mobile devices now. Um, and there's a whole lot of technology that makes that happen. Um, major investments are going into, uh, continue to go into increasing the ability for people to con 
consume video. So those trends are always going, o only going to ri rise. In fact, the 48 billion in a month is already pretty antiquated. It's up, I think, much bigger than that. I don't know what the latest statistic is. Um, uh, and on top of that, we saw video was, was booming. Um, infrastructure changes to make video consumption easier were changing. And then finally, we looked at the sponsor and advertising business, which really makes the entire in, our endurance sports industry go, to go, go around. That's where the money is. Um, and uh, globally, just outside of the endurance sports industry, sponsorship and advertising is increasingly shifting towards digital. Um, and advertising is, is digital. It's been digital for a while. There's still print advertising that are in existence, but um, digital advertising has is, 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 is been kind of, uh, it's been online for, for a long time. Sponsorship is now becoming very digital as well, and there's a difference between sponsorship and advertising. Um, sponsorship goes in, in depth a little bit more, but that is now becoming increasingly important um, to have some sort of digital presence. Video fits perfectly into the sponsorship space. Um, so we saw these trends and recognized that there was uh, an opportunity to address this. Um, we just had to figure out how video worked, and that was the challenge of our business. Um, so point three, finding a disruption strategy. It, that, this is um, the one that will be very important to talk about with to any industry, that applies to any industry. But what Holden was talking about, just to give you a, a, some examples, what does it mean that sponsorship is digital? And I'll give you an example. Um, it, used, it used to be for an event, somebody would put their, their sign up at the finish line. But now, there's a whole engagement before the event, and people are getting their information by video on the event websites and in social media. So instead of sending emails, the race directors are making videos, and they're talking about stuff that you have to pay attention to. So everyone's watching. And then they are doing some more high production value as well. That engagement all leading up to the event, imagine if you were Gatorade, um, and you had this opportunity to engage with an athlete as they were preparing for a marathon or any event, which goes from the day you register, could be a year, nine months, six months, all the way leading up to the event. So you've broadened, using digital and using video, you have broadened your whole engagement timeline. Uh, so that's number one. And then number two, there are ways to, a, a huge trend in video and in advertising is native content native content and branded content. There's a big debate about what native content is, but is unique to a site. So if there is, or unique to a property. So if there was the Marine Corps Marathon and they were doing, um, highlighting one of the Marines or, or say hello from overseas to home, and there were a sponsor that were aligned with that and presenting that or brought to you by, that, that's an image and, and they want to be seen by the audience as being part of that native content so they're closely associated with the event. It's more than just a finish line. They're associated with the emotions, with everything in that video. And then there's an element to digital sponsorship that is on site and afterwards. And it's really where technology has changed all of sponsorship. And we would just challenge you to think about your own industries and invent ways that technology can change relationships and how people work together. And with us, in the on-site activation, and, and post-activation, when there are photos and videos taken of the athletes, they are, it used to be that you would have to go online and they, or they'd be sent to you like a, a couple weeks later. Now you get them immediately, they're digital, and you share them with all of your friends on social media. So there's an opportunity, uh, let's say Gatorade was leading all up during the event and sponsoring a nutrition series or uh, the videos all the way up during the event, and then on site, all the photographs that were taken, Gatorade was right there and on the photograph, and then when that was shown, uh, you shared their names on it, and you're sharing and you're promoting their brand to everybody, so it's, it's viral-like. So there's ways that sponsorship used to sit all by itself, and, peop and these larger companies would do advertising and marketing, but what's happened because of technology is that sponsorship, since it does go deeper, like Holden said, and it's right on site at the event, it's so closely connected to the experience that they are now using digital to take that experience and amplify it on their own platforms afterwards. So how are they, we're doing that with, with video. So going back to form, uh, the, the third step is form a disruption strategy because we said that you can have the best idea in the world and it's very difficult to influence people. And uh, did anyone see the movie Jobs with Ashton Kutcher? There's a, there's a scene in there where I, I, I watch it over and over again when this happens to me. Um, 
he, he's in the very beginning, and he, he's going through, and he's on the phone with his, the line, you know, the coily line, and he's, and he's talking to you, he says, do you have a TV? Great. Do you have a typewriter? Great. Perfect. Can you, um, now, what if you could put them together? And he's hung up on, hung up on, and he's crossing off hundreds and hundreds of people, and it, he has this brilliant idea. Um, and it's disruptive, and it's just very difficult to get people to have a dissatisfaction. This is, this, is an, this is an equation that we use. It's the D in this equation. You can have this vision, and, and like Steve Jobs knew, he wanted to invent the personal computer. And, uh, but dissatisfaction, why, why do I need one? What, what's wrong with what I have now? I have a typewriter, I don't need that. And then the implementation, um, having an exact plan to implement. How are you gonna execute on it? Who are you going to use? How are you going to pay for it? Um, how are you going to distribute the whole execution plan? It's the implementation. So it's this vision times dissatisfaction times implementation. All those three elements are necessary to get change. And this is multiplicative. So any one of these, if you're missing dissatisfaction, there's no change. There's a zero in change. So I, I, I think what we have found um, and, and what I found in my, my career working at a larger company, an investment management organization, we're still trying to innovate within a larger organization and a bank, and that's challenging because um, of the culture. This dissatisfaction is the toughest piece. Um, you can have all the answers in the world, and, and I think that the most important thing that you come away it, if, if I were sitting here and thinking, well, what's the most important thing here that I can get from Silverline? It's how do you, how do you affect this equation? And that's what we want to share with you. Um, and we, let me move this. Our strategy to affect this equation was to start with influencers. And I've learned, we learned from experience that starting with companies that or people that don't have influence in the industry, even if you execute perfectly on those, it's not gonna take you as far as would be if you align yourself with industry influencers because everybody's going to look to them. And one of the examples of Marine Corps Marathon, uh, third largest marathon in the world, and um, very respected, hugely innovative, written up for their economic development impact, and in the running community. Um, and the Tour of Britain is like the, the, the Tour de France, but in, in Britain, it's a, it's a little bit smaller. And um, Holden has a fun, just a fun story to tell you about that, but uh, I'm gonna give him the mic. But we, we these organizations, what other people have signed on with us because we worked with them. And we worked with them to help them find dissatisfaction with the status quo. And it was, it, was really, it was really about this. It was about putting people in pain. Like, and that's really it. Because otherwise, people are so vested in what they were doing and that it worked. If it, it, they don't see that it's broken, uh, that there's not a risk associated with not doing something new, they're by definition putting themselves down, um, saying, well, what I was doing wasn't, wasn't, right, it wasn't as good and, and this is something better. And it's really hard. And even if you have every single element of that equation really strong, a vision, this is how it's going to work, dissatisfaction, look what's happening, and implementation, this is how we're going to do it. And we're going to be paying you to do it. You don't, you don't even have to because we have a, a dimension to fund it through sponsorship. It still might not work. And this is an example. This is a, this is a fabulous example. And I felt like... Steve Jobs did in that one scene, he was laying in the grass, like having a temper tantrum because he couldn't get people to see that his personal computer like makes all the sense in the world. And, and I felt that with, with this one, which we still haven't won, because I think it's good to share some, some learning experiences, some things that aren't totally successful. This is an example of challenge family. Challenge, maybe they'll hear this. <laughs> challenge family uh, is a competitor to Iron Man. You've heard of Iron Man? the triathlon series. And Challenge Family is outside of the US and they wanted to, they're coming to the US and they're arch rivals and they're taking each other's races and, and they, they don't like each other very much. And um, 
as soon as Challenge Family announced they were coming to the US, and that happened to be one of our clients, and we got that US race, we took a screenshot of the Challenge Family event, the, the one in, Am in Amsterdam, and we said, well, here's your, here's your website, Challenge Family, and you have Iron Man in the video player of your website, and you're advertising the, the, the Kona, the World Championship. And we had ha been having a dialogue with them, and they started sending emails across to each other that Iron Man hacked onto their site, <laughs> and what happened, and speculating, and panicking. And um, this is, all it is is that they embedded YouTube, and they're not controlling the video on their site. And here we are with this complete solution with great clients who are renewing with us, everybody's signing, we're growing fast, credible opportunities. We, we can end up handing them a check to make it happen, whole plan to implement, and they're not signed. So even when you have executed, when you've addressed every single element of that equation, it's still a numbers game, and you're going to get a lot of no's before you get a yes. I think part of the art is Balancing, you know, if you're true to being an entrepreneur, or being disruptive, you, you, you can't listen too much. Because if you listen too much and adapt too much, then it, you're getting away from what you know is right. And it's a matter of balancing some of the feedback that you're getting with, with staying true to what you know you have to do in order to dis disrupt. So I think that um, w that kind of feedback of not going with us and not giving us any reason why not. Um, we can't say, well, this, this isn't going to work. But there's an example that I think I want to talk about with adapting um, that I, we could talk about. I want to hold and talk about where we did adapt here, where we put our video. And um, I think that'd be helpful. We started on the, the group site and moved it. What, uh, our first approach to the business, when, when we, our first attempt at creating a, a video platform um, was on our own website. And uh, we invested considerable amount of money and, and development and time and work in building a website, building a whole infrastructure to, to create a, a, a video website. We we're signing partners and aggregating all of our event partners' videos onto our own website. The idea there was that we would have a great site with lots of great content on it, and we would run advertising and sell pre-roll ads and banner ads all over the place and make a lot of money off of that. Uh, and we had our first race, um, our very first one. We had a ton of great content. We invested, we, we were, Jamie and I were out filming with cameras. We're not camera people at all, but we had to make some video somehow. So we, we had content. Um, we had some other content that was coming from different places as well. And the event happened. And we put on the event website, which is where all the web traffic was going, we put a link that said, come here to Silverline to watch, watch video. And our watch page was white labeled. It wasn't even branded with Silverline. It, it looked just like the events page, but it was a separate website. And that redirect we saw was the issue. Just a single click to get people to click from that one website over to our website, we lost everyone. There was no traffic, a ton of traffic on the event website, especially on race day, um, that's Super Bowl week. Um, we saw a ton of web traffic, tons of engagement. They're there forever. Fans were coming to watch. They, everyone comes to see their results after the races are over. Um, we didn't get any of that traffic because there was a single, a single redirect. So all at once, Jamie and I were sitting in our global headquarters at the time, which was Jamie's house. And, uh, and we kind of looked at each other, and we saw the data that all this, the, the website had, the race website had all this, all this, all this viewership and all this, all this traffic, and we had very little, none. I think we had like, we had a couple, and many of them were me and like my family and our friends, Jamie's mom. We realized just right there, after spending a year of, of, of investment and, and work and creating, executing on a certain strategy, that we had to throw it all out and start over and basically put our technology where the people were. Um, so we needed to come up with a new strategy of embedding our play players, our technology, on those event websites because that's where the people were. And just like that, it was a two-second decision. We both kind of looked at each other and said, this isn't going to work. We have to change and completely change. And that was one of the biggest decisions that we've made um, and it, what, the most impactful decisions that we've made. We quickly adapted. We saw what wasn't working. We were small enough to quickly change things. It hurt a little bit because we had put some money into it, 
Um, and now we have this really robust website that we're not doing anything with. It's kind of sitting in the wings. Maybe we'll do something with it eventually. Um, but that was the big change. We recognized that we needed to have a different approach, and that's really kind of opened the doors for a, a lot more thinking and a lot, lot it, we, we, we've, that's, it, it really has kind of uh, changed the trajectory of how we do business and how we think about kind of implementing this strategy. We call it a decentralized video network, which is um, our, our, our key, I think, to, to how we approach things. To add to what Holden was saying about adapting, and, and piv that's a pivot, where we kept true. I mean, video, technology, endurance sports, make it accessible and easy for event managers, all those things were still there. So we didn't compromise any of that. It was just we, we did a pivot in where we published it. And we moved it from a centralized location back to right on the event website. And that, that's an example. And every time you hear feedback or you get data back and a new idea, that's when you have to weigh, is this something to pivot on or is this something I need to stay true to? And it's, that's a bit of an art. Um, and, and I would say when you're, when you're in an environment where you are really disrupting something, you have to be really strong to stay true to your idea um, because a lot of people are gonna have their own way of thinking about things and their own input that might not match yours or might not be in your best interest, or it's in their best interest. So just being aware that um, sometimes a change is going to be a necessary pivot, but be deliberate about that um, versus one that you're not you're going to elect not to do because it it, it it fundamentally changes like your what you're trying to do your goal. And and speaking of adapting, the the fourth is um, scaling to mass market, and I, I think. It is. I think, um, you know, when we look at it, it, it's kind of thinking about this theme of, of really having a, a strategy of distribution or, or, sorry, disruption, that's what we were trying to go out and do. We, we, were, we strategized for this before, before the, 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 like, very early on in the business. So and we, we had the forethought that, that at some point we were going to do anything that we needed to do to, to distribute our vision. You know, and go, going back to um, the slide of the, the our, our early adopters, these influencers, um, this was all about getting our vision out there. We wanted to put them in pain a little bit. We wanted to embarrass some people. Maybe we need to embarrass Challenge Family a little bit more. Um, but um, this was about vision. And what we did when we were trying to distribute our vision was very different from what we're thinking about now, which is scaling. Um, a completely different strategy, um, and I think that there's different thoughts on how to how to approach uh, 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 building your company so that it scales. I think some some people some some companies, especially in the technological world, are thinking about scale from day one. They're building something with efficiency that can replicate immediately. They're building an app that can they can sell for to, to millions and millions of users. When we think of a disruptive sort of technological innovation not necessarily thinking that from day one this is something that's going to be scalable. We have a vision that needs to be applied in some way and, and, and adopted by a, by a certain group of, of, of influencers in the industry, but we knew very well that that wasn't going to last and it wasn't scalable, um, and we never planned it to be. We just needed to get that vision out there, get people talking about it, and get people using our system, and then figure out how to scale. And we hadn't figured out how to scale when we started. Um, it was something that we were confident that we were going to be able to to kind of um, execute on. So, so scaling into into a mass mass market, we we kind of expected it. We, there was an expectation that we were going to 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 change things a bit. We're we're in that process right now and scaling things up a bit. Um, we knew that our product and our service in general was going to be completely different than what it was in in the in the beginning stages. So, um, we knew that our our buyer profile was going to be completely different. Um, one of our first partners was the Tour of Britain. That's a, a, an enormous race. It's it's got global television coverage. It, it's you know there's a Tour of France and then there's the Tour of Britain. Um, we don't we don't there's not many Tour of Britons in the world. Those aren't our clients, and, and we knew that um, you know we've got one that's excellent. They're influencers. They can influence a lot of people. But ultimately, for Silverline, um, when we're thinking about scale, we want every turkey trot 
5K that happens on Thanksgiving in small towns, you know, or, or local local 10Ks. Those are those are the, our buyers, and they operate very differently than the Tour Britain does. Uh, and how we went about kind of distributing to those people and the distribution strategy that we're taking to access that different buyer profile um, has has been changed. And all of this again was just an expectation that we had from the beginning, and it kind of plays into this bigger picture of a roadmap, a strategic roadmap that we have that we're setting out to cause some disruption, we had a plan to, to go about doing that. In working with the influencers, and influencers can be in a large company, you know, that your immediate people that you work with, or, um, or even in different departments, it could be in, in anything. It doesn't have to be a startup where you're inventing something new. And, and what we found to be successful along the way here, and that I have in, in my prior career, was that when you work with influencers in a really easy, way create some successes um, you're building momentum and you're building confidence in yourself and you're also testing out the things that work and don't work so when we started we didn't we, we worked with the influencers originally we didn't build a, a video content management system we didn't invest in that we were on the phone in the marine corps marathon and said okay i'm uploading a video to dropbox i want you to publish it on tuesday on the front page and on the library player and put it in second position. And then we did. Um, and we, it didn't make sense to go invest in all of that until we, we proved that this made sense. And you can save, uh, technology now makes it, makes it really easy to, to, to create some success stories without putting a lot of investment or time. So when you look, you wanna get like small wins with influencers, and that does not have to be expensive. It can be quick. So it, instead of like being overwhelmed by saying, I have to build this entire video management system where you have to distribute to everybody all at once. I mean, it, 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 what if it didn't work and nobody watched video? You know, it wouldn't have made sense. So just to take an easy way, and, and then what Holden is talking about is, is that, that's the strategy for number one, how do you do it and do it in an inexpensive, quick, efficient way. And then number two is when you've invested in the technology and you've, you're building on what you learned and you're bringing a different kind of product that's, that's mass market that might have a different angle in services. This is not yet a self-service sales platform that will come next, but it's a scaled down version of the service, a different revenue share, and, and a different amount of, um, of interaction. We couldn't scale what we were doing with, with our large clients. And I think that knowing at the outset, or starting to think of a plan at the outset of how you're going to scale it, knowing that's a whole different animal than implementing day one is really important, and it, and it manages your expectations. And just to summarize, talking about that there's two, two types of disruption, um, inventing a new technology, if your skill is rooted in new tech, is, is in tech, or in disruptive innovation, and that's just applying a technology. And that's in any kind of company, in any kind of career. Um, it might be something that you have a, a, a passion for that you're not going to school for, um, but that you're doing on the side. But when you intimately know that industry, and you know people in that industry, and you're motivated to make a change, um, those are all expertise to use in that type of innovation that might not be inventing a new technology. And the next that we learned um, is putting people in pain and that you do have to create this d dissatisfaction because if you don't have that, it's, it's not gonna work. And something that we've learned in this is that the dissatisfaction that we think people should have is too complex for them to handle right now. And just to, to explain our situation, our event managers are dissatisfied right now today because they can't control their video experience like the Iron Man on Challenge Family. But what they really should be dissatisfied about is that they are at risk from losing sponsorship. But they don't see that yet. Um, we do, but it's not gonna sell people to be dissatisfied right now and we have to be patient. Um, and, th and then next is, is expect to adapt, which is going from one stage when you're starting and, and, and getting some traction with influencers and what it looks like and how to scale your business. And that's a totally different marketing, um, marketing distribution strategy, a different product offering, a variation of it. 
um, and different technology. And then lastly, which is really important, is, is letting resistance fuel your motivation. Because if you really are disruptive, by definition, people aren't going to like it. People who are comfortable or who are, are rooted in what they did, are vested in what they did, they are not going to like what you're doing. And that can be a competitor, it can be a colleague, a manager. Um, and when you embrace that resistance and you say, yep, every time somebody says, no, that makes no sense, I'm happy with what I did, and you embrace that and it fuels you, and that we do that all the time, um, you have to. And you have to say, well, this is just more evidence. We're doing something that just has never been done before. And, I, and who, a, who has the first question? Great, thanks for that question. The question was, uh, who, who, do, who did our initial coding and who does it presently? And, and when do we hire or who did we hire? When, when, how early? So. Uh, our initial coding um, was we were not going to to hire anyone. That was uh, especially for that first project that we threw away. Um, that was all third party. Um, it, the the way our system works, we're basically licensing a, a video platform from Brightcove, which is the slide that you saw to begin with. Um, we utilize we really stretched the limits of what Brightcove could do. Um, and as Jamie was mentioning, we were we were accepting video files from our from our partners via Dropbox, loading them into our Brightcove platform and then distributing out that way, basically embedding those videos on other partners' websites. So it was really raw and, and granular. Um, I was doing a lot of that as well. Um, and at the time I was less than experienced to, to do a whole lot of that. So it was it was uh it was uh at at first there wasn't a whole ton of of technological development that we were doing in house. Um, last summer we hired an intern from P from Penn State who I think it might be he was in class and he might be standing outside the door. Um, he was phenomenal for us and he's coming back. His name is Chris Hoffbauer and uh, we've hired him full time. So that was about two years into our business, I think, when Chris, like eight, 18 months or so um, when Chris came on. Chris has been um, the brains behind a lot of what we've done to kind of develop our own IP and, and strategy. So he's, he's been helpful there. We still rely pretty heavily on a uh, on on Brightcove and a consulting group that's very closely connected with Brightcove because um, they do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, they know Brightcove's the, the APIs of, in, the, of, of the Brightcove makes available pretty intimately, um, and we're using them to develop some of our strategies right now. There's a lot that we do um, in terms of player design that requires some specific coding. Um, and our business is a bit challenging in that um, as a decentralized video network, we are embedding and managing and working with lots of different websites. And we have to figure out a way to make that all work smoothly. Um, so that's really the challenges that we face internally. Other questions? Good question. The moment we decided to work together, uh, Jamie and I have known each other for a while. Um, we're both Penn Staters. We didn't know each other here at Penn State. Um, Jamie was a triathlete. I was a triathlete. I was a coach as well. And I first met Jamie as a coach. Um, I was coaching her. She was training for an Ironman. We've got lots of funny stories about, about our coach-athlete relationship and kind of how that's all transitioned. But at a certain point, we both realized that we were both really passionate about the endurance sports industry. Um, we worked together really well, as was evident through a, a coach-athlete relationship that we had for five years prior to starting Silverline. So we were good friends. We worked together well. We came together um, and did a little bit of work together locally in Philadelphia where the, the, our company's based. Um, there's an organization there, a foundation called the Cadence Cycling Foundation, which is a, a, a youth organization about uh, 
that teaches kids to ride bikes, teaches life skills through through cycling. Uh, Jamie was on the board. I was a coach for that program. Um, so we did a little bit of work together there, and that was really what it was what it was about for us. We both um, we worked together really well, uh, and we were both really passionate and had a, an understanding about what our industry was. Um, yeah. Since we're family at Penn State, I'm going to tell you also like the real story <laughs> too. I Holden and I talked about endurance sports all the time, and he's a coach, and I love disruption, fragmented industries. And I saw him one day; he was doing a bike fit, and I said, "What are you going to do when you're completely obsolete? You're an, you're going to be an app. Like who needs you? And who needs coaching anymore? What's going to happen?" And we got into this giant discussion about coaching and that there's different levels of coaching and that yes there's online apps and when you sign up to do the New York Marathon you can sign up for that but then you will not have with your coach they're not going to be calling you the night before the race and saying did you do this this and this and when you with this is where you're going to line up when you do your swim and when you're finished with your event and you've either poured your heart out and been successful or poured your heart out and failed they're, they're not the app isn't going to be there for you so we came up with this plan that with this idea that there are different segments of coaching and then we said, coaching is too small. This is like technology that could disrupt this entire industry. And, and it, I guess it all comes back to when I was looked at Holden and we were doing a bike fit, and I was like, you're going to be obsolete, <laughs> right? How did that make you feel? That was definitely a, I remember vividly that conversation. Um, you know, but that was, that was kind of a, a spark as well, because that definitely was what was happening. We just started discussing what was going to become of the endurance sports industry. So that's really what it was. We, we weren't, again, we weren't technologists. We liked to work together. We were passionate about this industry. We recognized that there was something that needed to happen and something was going to happen in the endurance sports industry from a technological pers perspective. And we decided to do something about it. Um, and I think this last point that we have on the, on the summary about letting resistance fuel your motivation, I think we were both athletes. It's a very athletic mindset. Um, as an athlete, especially when you're trying to achieve something um, really great and you're trying to reach your full potential, there's lots of people and lots of obstacles kind of that are, are in your way. You kind of have to adopt an attitude that you really are not going to let anything get in your way. Um, you know, it, it, that, that's very athletic, and I think it was kind of ingrained in both of our, our minds that um, it didn't really matter that we didn't come from a technological background to change an in industry, and that was our only motivation, um, and we set out to, to do that, um, and it's been good enough. Uh, how did you come up with the name Silverline? Silverline, the, uh, the name Silverline, we were just talking about this the other day. Um, so the name Silverline, we, we define Silverline, again, it kind of gets back to an athletic point of view. We feel that, um, I think when most people think about Silverline, they think of kind of something good or something positive coming out of something negative. We don't necessarily think of, we certainly think of like that result, something happening um, because of some other instance, um, but we don't think the impetus for, for that change necessarily needs to be negative. It's, we, we like to think of Silverline as being um, something that's something that's happened because of something else that's happened. But in, when you're an athlete um, and you train a whole lot, the end result is like magic. You never know what to expect. Um, you know, you, you put in a year's work of worth, or a year's worth of work, and then you go to a single race, and it's all kind of on the line right there. And it's really difficult to see the perspective of everything that went into that one moment. Um, and it definitely seems like magic. The the best races, even training sessions that, that either one of us have ever had, you come out of them and you're always left with this feeling of like, how the hell did that happen? Like, I can't believe I just did that. Um, that's what Silverline sort of means to us. We, we like the idea of, of creating something, kind of setting the wheels in motion and seeing what, be, seeing what happens because of it. That's kind of was at the core of, uh, of what we were thinking about when we started the business. We, were, we wanted to set some wheels in motion and see what happened. Where do we see Silverline a year from now? Well on our way to dominating the industry with 50% market share of having 
50% of all endurance events using, solar, is using our video platform on their event websites. And then the longer term is global domination. <laughs> I mean, that's what we say on, uh, that's what we, that's what we, we believe. We worked, our, we incorporated in February 2012. We did not charge those influencers the first year. We funded that all out of 401k and credit cards. That's our own money. We funded everything to get the data points. And um, it was after 18 months that we just started charging our clients. And what's happened since then, so it's 18 months. And then t since then, everyone who was an influencer that wasn't being charged before um, has all re-upped and they're, they're paying us now. What would you say is the most rewarding thing about starting your own company? The most rewarding thing about starting our own company? I think like realizing your vision um, and seeing results from an idea that you had and like y you own it. And, and I think that um, it's, it's nothing, your ideas are not diluted. Your vision is not diluted. And I'm saying that having come from a company, a, a 45,000 person global organization where the, the, the memos and, and meetings and committees in order to get an idea done. I mean, those are very good, all that structure, and you learn a lot from, from building, building relationships and making things happen in those organizations. But um, the most rewarding thing here now is that what we want to do, like our goal, is, is not diluted by anyone. And that's really cool. I think that, uh, so feedback from our early adopters, first, first users, um, uh, much of it was technological. Um, again, the challenge that we were, have, have been facing was that with lots of different websites, um, working with event promoters, they're not technologists. We were asking them to do something techno technological, you know, and e even, even embedding a, a video, some H, which is just an HTML code that we emailed over to them and asked them to place on their website, they couldn't do it, you know. So there was some challenges there. Um, so that was, there was some feedback to that. Um, and I think that, so just implementation, we call it, there were some technological implementation questions and problems that we had to face, some things that we weren't expecting on that front as well, little bugs that we weren't totally expecting. But then on the, on the business side of things as well, um, we were getting a lot of questions and a lot of feedback of what to do with video, what type of content to make, um, what, what type of content was, was working. Um, we took the position that um, event managers are, are using video really for a variety of different reasons, but they're primarily at the core of it all, they're trying to engage their audience. They've got customers, people who participate in their races, and so they want to speak to those, those, those customers. Um, and we we felt as though uh, our position was that if we provided the technological tools and kind of kept our noses out of the, the video production work, um, that the event managers would know what know how to address their audience. They, that is their business. They know what their audience needs to see. Um, that was our position. Jamie and I, to this day, argue about what we should do in this in this regard. But but to this day, we still um, get the question with every new, new partner that we have, how to make content, what, what, what kind of content should I use? Um, so we weren't completely expecting that. And we've, we've, we share best practices now. We kind of have a, a few different styles and types of content that we know works really well at different times throughout the, throughout the year, like a race course preview or a race, a race recap video might, might work really well. Um, but uh, that was, that was a, the content issue was a big piece of feedback as well. I would add about the feedback part and being able to use technology to your advantage if, if you understand it, is that our clients being non-tech, we were giving them the feedback. 
and looking at the analytics and the engagement and teaching them that you have an 85% engagement rate, do you, the, the Marine Corps Marathon. So when a video comes up, 85% of the time, if it comes up and it has an impression, someone pushes play and they watch 85% of that video. And if you tell that to anyone in the digital media world, their jaws drop because that, we're talking single digits. So with the feedback, they may not have known. They couldn't know in the service what feedback to give, but whether or not this was working for them, they needed us to put together the analytics and to explain to them, this is when people are watching your video, this is the, these are the devices they're watching it on, and, and this, is, this is how they're using the platform. And giving them that feedback, the feedback from that was, that's fantastic, because we, we they're non-tech, they don't measure other stuff. And this is one of the first things that they were measuring. I think that one other really important piece of feedback that we that we got that we're we're really starting to address more right now at this stage in our business is um, it was our expectation that our event managers um, would 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 know what to do with our platform when it came to selling it to their sponsors and selling you know adding on to using the digital inventory to incorporate into their sponsorship strategies and uh, and by and large. They haven't, been, they haven't been able to do that. They've, they've asked for our help. They want us to get involved and kind of perform a service. They've, they've had us be involved in, in, in meetings with them. In, in with, so we're talking with large brands, and that's great for us. We can go in and have a, have a conversation with a, with a big brand who might be interested in advertising or sponsoring a, one of our events. Um, but we weren't expecting that. We thought we would be just a technological platform that we would empower these events, but we've really gotten our hands dirty and, and perform, perform some client services in that regard. That is a great question, and I think that being very honest, in uh, this speaks to finance or from here, it's the same. I do believe that um, you need to be s smarter and, and more strategic, and you have to leverage um, your emotional intelligence very well to learn how to influence people. Um, and I think that you need to do that in, in a way that works best for you, um, it be, being an advice for, for females. And I think that as you look at everything that you read, um, diversity on teams makes for a better result, and they've proven that statistically. But you can't lead with that research, um, that, and that's the tough thing. And it, it, it's, it's making a deliberate effort to put yourself in a position when you're underwriting a company or an industry, um, or the company, that you're putting yourself in a position where the culture is going to allow you to thrive. And thinking that you can af affect a culture, um, that's definitely possible. It, it takes a lot of energy and um, strength to be able to do that. And when you're in the technology world or in the endurance sports world, you know, women are minority, but I don't think that's, that's too different than any other industry. So I think that um, just be, being aware that even if you do, just like that equation is, um, this might be somewhat cynical, but even like they, we had that equation there, vision times implementation times dissatisfaction, you do all those things right that you get change. Even if you have the perfect equation, um, and, y and you are really skilled and you find a great company that you could thrive, you have the emotional intelligence to make it happen, um, I'd, I'd say that equation is multiplicative as well to get bringing out your best. So I think that that's, that's my advice on there is that that's an equation that's multiplicative as well. So underwrite the company and your pos the location underwrite the company really put a lot into it.
Thank you. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, Maria and Adam are going to be handing out the stickers for the passports. And if you guys don't have one, we have extras too.